It's okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's um, Facebook session, which is going to go through some of the unwritten driving rules um, that uh, people will use when they're out and about. Now, as a learner drivers, some of these are not necessarily things that you would want to be doing, but it's really important that you understand that other people will do them, how they may behave, and also how they may expect you to behave and how they may react when you maybe do things as per the book, shall we say, rather than as per the sort of conventions. So, as I say, we've got the unwritten driving rules. Just paste it there. Um, some of them may actually get you into trouble um, if you don't obey them. Um, we've got lots of rules um, from the Acts of Parliament. The Highway Code is the main one that we would um, that we would obey. But there are lots of things that people do um, that really come from codes of conduct and, and etiquette. Um, and you won't find them in any rule books, <coughs> but you could get into trouble following them. Um, but as I say, it's really important that you understand them. So. Let's kick off with the first one. Um, and the first one is one that, uh, if you've been learning with me for any length of time, you will probably have heard about, and that will be flashing headlights. Okay, so people use their headlights, um, flash their headlights for all kinds of meanings. Um, they will use them to thank you, they will use them to give way, um, they may use them to um, to warn you. Um, now, officially, the only thing that flashing your headlights actually means is a warning of your presence. <clears throat> it's the same as the horn in that respect. Um, the only thing it means is that somebody is there. So when you sound your horn, you're warning people that you're there. When you flash your lights, you're warning people that you're there. Um, and obviously that is potentially more useful at night, um, but can also be done during the day. Now, the problem with flashing headlights is it's quite indiscriminate. So who are we flashing at? And if we're not using it for the official meaning, why are we flashing? So you have to be very careful. Um, and you certainly should not flash your own headlights at another driver for anything other than a warning of your presence. If another driver does flash their headlights, then you need to try and work out why they're doing it. OK. Are they doing it for you? Sometimes it's obvious, you know, if there's only yourself in the vicinity um, and, you know, maybe you're facing off against each other on a junction, they may give a brief flash of the headlights um, indicating they want you to move. However, where there's other road users present, you can't be sure and you have to be careful. So my advice is that if somebody appears to be trying to give way to you by using the headlights or any other means is Give them a thumbs up. Let them know that you're aware that they're happy for them for you to move, if that's what they appear to be to be doing. But then make sure that you do your own checks. Don't just rely on the fact that they flash their headlights or giving you any other signal for this matter to say that you can go, because you don't really. You basically, if you have an accident, they're not going to hang around and say, "Sorry, it's my fight, fault, mate. I told you to go." They're going to be long gone. They may not even stick around to be a witness. So it's always your responsibility. Um, and this is one of the reasons why flashing of the headlights is frowned upon for these reasons, because it tends to be quite a, um, an invitation to do something. And quite often people will just jump at the um, opportunity to go. And they're also distracted by the driver that's maybe given the, the flashing of the headlights. Um, and maybe that's where they're looking rather than doing the further checks to make sure it's safe. So if you receive a flash of the headlights or some other kind of beckoning, make sure that you are actually sure that it's safe to go. Do your checks. And as I say, give a thumbs up to the driver so they can see it, so they know that you've seen it. And therefore, they don't take your hesitation to move as, 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 a, as a reason for them to just think, oh, she didn't see me. He didn't see me. I'm going to go. It puts doubt into their mind if they know that you've seen them, but then you're doing your own checks. On the flip side, as I said, you shouldn't use your headlights in this way to, to thank people or to um, to uh, to give way to them. So how do you do it? 
Well, if you're going to give way, simply slow down and wait. Or it might hopefully just slow down. If you do it early enough, then people will realise. But what it also does is because you don't actively ask them to pull out, it, it tends to put the onus on them to do their own checks. Um, and they will look because they, they're not quite sure what you're doing because they're expecting you to flash your headlights. Um, or a slight nod of the head on a smile is another way of giving way. If you're going to thank people, simply hold your left hand up to say thank you. This can also go for people behind you. If you hold it up towards the mirror, they'll be able to see you. Um, so you basically thank people or give way in a way that's quite passive from your point of view um, and allows them to make their own decision and doesn't invite them to do something. So the second one, again, this is to do with lights and this is using your hazard lights. Okay, The only time you should use your hazard lights is if you are an obstruction. Um, for example, if you've had a breakdown. Um, but again, they get overused. People will use them to thank you. They will use them when they're being towed. Again, all of these things are illegal. The only time you're now allowed to use your hazard lights when you're moving is in on a motorway. So if you're on a, on a motorway and traffic ahead of you is starting to slow down abruptly, it is now acceptable to put your headlights, sorry, your hazard lights on as you slow down to warn traffic following you that we need to be slowing down. So that is the only use of the hazard lights. You also do have to be careful because if you use your hazard lights in some other way but one side of your car is obscured, it may not be obvious that all of your lights are on and people may think that you're indicating to move one way or the other. Now parking. Parking is also an area where people tend to take liberties um, and uh, sorry I'll just finish that post off. So you want to try and park in a way that is take is, is, is taking account of other people. Um, so be generous with your parking. Um, don't uh, leave massive gaps between you and the car in front or behind if it's not necessary. Around about a metre and a half should be enough and that you leaves more road space for other people to park. At the same time, don't park the same way as they do in some of the continental countries. Um, I've been to Spain and France and sometimes seen cars that are literally, in fact, not even just touching. I've seen at least two cars where the car behind the sofa pushed into the other one, but the bumper was bent. Um, that tends to be the way they, they, they park there. How, how, quite how they get out, I don't know. You couldn't even get out with a can opener, let alone drive out. So we're not looking for that, but at the same time, we're not looking for massive gaps that mean that uh, other people can't use um, parking spaces that should otherwise be there. Um, at the same time, parking on the pavement is, is not something that's recommended. Um, however, there are a number of streets in a number of towns, and Halifax is by no means an exception, where um, if you're going to park on both sides of the road, then parking on the pavement is the only way that a gap large enough for cars to fit down the middle. Um, is, is possible, especially if you go around um, Queen's Road off Gibbet Street, that sort of place. You'll find a lot of very narrow streets, a lot of the back to back terraces where there is simply not enough room. There's no off road parking. These houses were built when people didn't have personal vehicles, so they didn't have anywhere to put them. So they go on the street. Um, so whilst they've talked about making parking on the pavement illegal in all areas, not just in London, um, it is going to be interesting to see if this is something they actually do implement um, because um, if they do, as I say, don't know, some, it's just not going to be practical because um, in the UK, as in many countries these days, we have far too many cars and not enough space. Um, so if you haven't got off-road parking, where are you going to put your car? Um, that is why when properties are built uh, these days, they have to have off-road parking, either be a driver or some form of garaging. Next one is to do with motorways. Now, um, 
as a learner driver, uh, once you've achieved a high enough standard, you can actually now practice on the motorway, and I have already taken some of you on the motorway um, uh, during the course of your lessons. Um, it's something that uh, we tend to do later on when your your standard is is getting nearer to test standard, um, and you know we usually need at least a an hour and a half, two hours to be able to get to the motorway and spend a reasonable time on it. Um, now, one of the things about driving on the motorway is allowing traffic to merge on the motorways. Um, when and this also applies to dual carriageways. So, for example, Ellen Bypass um, going from up up towards Amy Top is an area where this would also be relevant. When you are approaching a slip road for traffic to enter, you should, as you recognise it's there, consult what's behind you. Have a look in your mirrors um, and possibly even in your blind spot to see if traffic is coming up behind you and if so, how much time and space you have. Um, and then also be aware as to whether anybody is trying to come on to the motorway slash dual carriageway. If they are, then you really should try to facilitate their entry. Now you do have right of way. However, it's not really good driving to drive in such a way that you deliberately stop another car entering the motorway slash um, dual carriageway. That uh, just causes a potential for um, collisions. So. If you're aware that the relative speed of you and the cars trying to get on means that you are going to um, reach the same point at the same time, you should look to see whether you can adjust either your position or your speed in such a way that that traffic can also get on the motorway. And quite often moving over to the middle slash right hand lane, depending on how many lanes are on the motorway, is going to be the, the way to do that. And this is why it's really important that uh, you're aware of what's going on behind you as you approach the slip road so that you can move over um, quite easily if, if the opportunity arises. If there's nowhere to move to, then you may want to consider whether a change in your speed, usually a dropper, dropping the speed to allow them to come on easily in front of you is going to be the, the better thing to do. Um, be aware that some people coming onto the motorway see it as a divine right to come on, so if you you know, if there are people sat in the middle lane, and, and this is one of the other things that uh, can cause problems for this, um, you get middle lane hoggers. Um, so they will sit in the middle lane um, and they won't move over. Um, so they can make it tricky for you to move. Um, some people trying to come on will see that oh, they're coming on regardless. Uh, they'll come on at high speed. So you have got to be careful. Although officially it's your right of way, some people trying to get on the motorway don't see it that way and they will try and force their way on even if you're struggling to make space for them. So it's better to, again, as always, plan ahead, spot those um, entries early. Usually they're um, accompanied by an exit and the exit will come before the entry. So as you go past the exit, usually around about half a mile on, you're gonna find an entry. So it's easy to know where they are. Um, just start consulting what's going on behind you and work out how you're gonna let that traffic or time you even emerge with that traffic safely. Next one is very relevant to us um, and something that uh, it would be nice to see more of and that is giving learner drivers space. Now believe it or not everybody on the road was a learner once. Um, it, so it could be quite surprising to hear that that's the way some people drive you'd think that they they were born drivers, but uh, it's not true. Most everybody learned once. But as soon as people pass or within a few months slash years of that, they seem to forget the trials and tribulations and what it's like to be uh, um, a learner driver. And they um, just treat learner drivers badly. We, we've seen it. I mean, I've got plenty of examples on my YouTube channel of very bad driving in and around learner drivers, um, be it when I was driving on my own or when I was driving with learners. Um, just give me a moment. So um, it's important to give learner drivers space. Now, it's a good idea if you as a learner also think about this, especially as you progress. 
Um, as you get nearer and nearer to your test standard and you know the point time when you're going to take your test, you do want to consider um, other learner drivers and not necessarily get too close to them yourself. Uh, because you don't no idea what stage they're at. They, you know, they may be going into traffic for the first time and they may be nervous and you know that means that when they're at traffic lights or junctions they're possibly going to stall. Um, if you're getting too close to them that's going to catch you out and again if this is your driving test and you're not really thinking about what could happen like that and the learner driver in front of you stalls and then you get stuck behind them that could reflect badly on you in the examiner's eyes. So give learner drivers t time and space even when you're learning yourself um, and just think about what could their standard of driving be like and could that cause an issue for you. Now again this one's related more to out of town driving um, and this is about HGVs, heavy goods, lorries, um, same would apply to buses as well. Allow them to overtake so they don't lose momentum. Again this is going to really apply mainly on the um, multi-lane roads uh, like the motorway. If you are being overtaken by a large heavy vehicle don't be tempted to speed up at all. Um, if anything you would want to slow down a bit and allow them to um, to overtake you um, because if you start to um, speed up it's going to make it very difficult for the HGVs to get past and one of the things that large lorries do depend upon is momentum so if you start to speed up they're going to struggle to speed up and they may have to back off and drop back behind you and then they have to build the speed up again and when you're trying to pull 40 tons that's not easy the same sort of thing applies when you're traveling down a hill if you see a large vehicle coming up the hill even if the obstruction is on their side it's good practice for you to slow down and allow them to come up rather than um, try and force your way through because they have the obstruction on their side um, again it's it's all about trying to think of others and not necessarily be selfish about the way you drive. Now number one allowing cars out of junctions. This often depends on how the other car approaches the junction as to whether people let them out and a lot depends also on the kind of traffic on the main road. So if you're in a queue um, and again I always try and advise people of this if, you, if you're trying to get off a, a side road into a road that's queuing it's much more likely that the people in the queue will let you out if they're moving very slowly um, and again I suggest that you try to make eye contact with people if they then appear to want to let you out as I said earlier don't necessarily just go make sure you check to make sure it's safe check to your left just in case traffic's halted on your left or maybe somebody's crossing the road um, and again give them that thumbs up to say that you've seen them and that you're happy and you're aware that they're letting you pull out now on the flip side should you let people pull out of junctions yes and no okay so yes where you're in a similar situation to the one I've just described. If you're queuing, you should not block junctions. You should hold back. Just leave a space, give a smile, give a slight nod of the head, stay where you are, and people trying to pull out should get the, get the picture and, and start to pull out. What I would be less inclined to do is, especially on a driving test, is to try and not slow down appreciably. Uh, but in your own mind you think to yourself oh I'm going to let them out and you're slowing down a bit. Going back to the first point which is flashing of the headlights most people expect drivers to flash the headlights at them or wave them out neither of which you can do and when they don't see you doing that they're going to be very reticent about pulling out and then what will happen is because they're not pulling out you'll start to slow down more and more and more until you maybe almost come to a stop and the traffic behind you is also going to be confused um, so generally speaking the advice that we give to people on a driving test is don't go out of your way to try and let other people pull out um, because of the lack of your ability to give the, the sort of signals that they're expecting to see um, I, hope, I hope that makes some sense to you. 
again overtaking something that we're probably going to be doing a lot less of certainly of moving traffic um, if somebody behind you is looking to try and overtake you then don't make their life difficult okay ease off let them get past you again especially if it's a larger vehicle um, if you're you shouldn't be driving overly slow um, hopefully you're trying to keep up to the speed limit um, if you're driving particularly slowly well below the speed limit there's no good reason for doing that again on your driving test you are going to be criticized for that because um, you're you're not making appropriate progress or you're un unduly hesitating um, but if somebody is trying to overtake you, regardless of whether they're doing it legally or, or in a way that you consider to be safe, the best thing to do is to just let them get past you. Um, because if you make their life difficult, it's going to take them longer to get past you. And that's going to increase the risk of some kind of, of collision um, in the opposite direction. So say so don't make life difficult for people overtaking you let them get past you um, and uh, and then be on your way if somebody is trying to get past you then um, it's better for them to go because they'll probably be crawling all over the back of your car um, and that's not a great position it's very pressured let them go let them become somebody else's problem right so the next item is and again, not so much of an issue when you're a learner, but uh, post that, one of the things you may want to do when you've got your, your own car is to uh, get the stereo on. Um, again, think of others, don't have it on so loud that people are turning around and, and looking, especially when you're in quiet areas. Um, it speaks for itself and it can be a distra distraction as well. Um, you know, if you have got um, an emergency vehicle near you and your music's on extremely loud, you're not going to hear the approaching siren and maybe you're going to be in the way for too long. Um, now one thing you may not know um, is that if you wanted to you can actually have the radio on during your driving test. Um, I have had people that have gone down this route um, you have the, the music on obviously quite quite low um, Sometimes it just takes a little bit of pressure out of the situation. Um, we can do it during lessons as well if people get bored of listening to me. Um, but uh, it can just make the, the situation a little bit less like a test and a little bit more um, relaxed. I've also had people who uh, maybe drive a bit too quickly, in which case we've suggested that maybe putting classic FM on, something like that, would be a good idea. Um, because it might just remind them to, to drive a bit more slowly. I don't suggest that you put ACDC on during your driving test, um, although uh, that may well have the opposite effect. Now, rubbernecking. Uh, again, this is something a lot of people do um, when they're driving um, and there's been some kind of incident, um, usually on the other carriageway. Uh, people are in a traffic jam wondering why they're going slowly and as they get closer to the incident something's happening the emergency service is there and, and people start to slow down a little bit more to, to look to see if they can see what's going on why they're being slowed down well the reality in actual fact is the main reason why they've been slowed down is lots of people slowing down to have a look to see why they've been slowed down and that causes more of a delay than the emergency services literally being there, especially when it's on the other carriageway, um, you'll find a traffic jam tends to happen on a carriageway that's not being involved in the incident because people are slowing down to look. So it, it is a bit of a morbid thing to be doing to try and to, to, to look to see you know who, who the victim is or whatever. Try not to do it, just try to carry on driving at a normal pace and again we'll will not delay things and we will get everywhere we want to be a little bit more easily. Using the road space. Now, this one is really about where you have multiple lanes and you have queuing. I'll give you a great example of where this happens. 
um, in Halifax, and that is the end of the dual carriageway coming down from um, Ellen Bypass coming down towards Halifax. You'll quite often have a lot of queuing going on um, before you get to um, the, the Copley turnoff. And quite often you'll have one lane, the left lane, very long, stretching maybe all the way back to the bend. Um, and the other lane is is maybe, you know, only a, a dozen cars or so long. Um, and, and that's because the British like to queue. Um, we're supposed to use a, a process called zippering, which is simply to do this. The car should merge in. And in actual fact, on that particular piece of road, it does tell you to merge in turn specifically. It tells you where to start merging in turn as well. Um, but people don't like to do it. And then what you tend to do is find that the people that do understand what they're supposed to do, which is to come steadily down the outside lane and then merge when the opportunity arises, start having to um, fight with the people on the inside lane because they think that they're being pushy. Um, so again, my advice here is that uh, you would use, well, you'd look to see, you know, where, if, the, if the lane, um, both lanes are being reasonably equally used, I would suggest staying in the left-hand lane and just wait your turn, drive to the left. But if the left-hand lane is extremely long and the right-hand lane is virtually empty, then it would be better to just go down the right-hand lane and make better use of the road space. Um, but don't go bombing down the outside and then try and fly in, because, again, people that try and look pushy don't tend to get a very good uh, treatment by their fellow road users. Just come down steadily and then start to look for where a gap's going to appear. If you've got somebody on your left-hand side who is steadfastly not looking at you, has no intention of letting you in, is making sure that there's no gap in front of them, so what? Just let them go. And you'll usually find that the car behind will leave a gap and you'll just slot in behind them. It's, it's only one car, it makes no difference. But at the end of the day, we are trying to zip in like this rather than all follow behind each other. Now, warning other people of speed traps. Again, this comes back to flashing the headlights. Um, nobody likes to be caught speeding. Um, you could argue that you're not going to be caught speeding if you don't speed. Um, but uh, it does happen, and that's why the police have um, speed traps. It's either speed cameras, temporary speed cameras, or permanent speed cameras. But it's usually the, the temporary speed cameras, the, the officer with the traffic gun or the uh, police vans that to track this sort of behaviour. And what you'll find is traffic coming towards you may be flashing their lights at you for no obvious reason. Again, this goes back to right at the beginning, why, is, why are people flashing their lights at you? Um, and as I say, this might be one of the reasons. Um, as I say, it is illegal. Um, to do it and if uh, another officer further up the road is aware that this is being done the people flashing the lights can be pulled over um, and prosecuted for uh, interfering with the officer's duties um, so don't do it um, you know hopefully people won't speed and they'll, they'll not get caught out but uh, you don't want to fall foul on the other side um, but again be aware that this is what people do do so as you're driving along on a straight piece of road usually um, if you see people flashing the lights at you for no obvious reason then just consider that that could be that there is a, uh, a speed camera around the corner make sure you're within the legal speed limit um, before you uh, carry on um, and just uh, you know don't fall foul of it another one which comes down to multi-lane roads. This is not driving in other people's blind spots. So if uh, you're following somebody and you're in their blind spot, remember that a lot of drivers don't check their blind spot before moving. If you think back to last week's video, we were talking about one of the uh, top 10 faults for failing a driving test is use of mirrors before you change direction. Um, not checking your mirrors, not checking your blind spot before you move lanes. Um, that is a bad habit that continues on into experienced drivers and you'll find people will sometimes move lanes without checking their blind spots. 
So again, you should be aware of that. And as a result, you should think carefully about your position. If you are going to pass somebody, do it briskly. Don't linger because as you linger alongside them, you'll be in their blind spot. And if you're not going that much more quickly than them, you might be in the blind spot a bit longer than is safe. And if they move over, you've possibly got nowhere to go in terms of space to your right. Um, so again, that's why we don't want to be sitting in people's blind spots. Uh, places where that's going to happen uh, in and around Halifax are going to be coming down Ovenden Way, um, coming down the Arken Way um, after Parkinson Lane, going down towards the big roundabout, um, and again on the Ellen Bypass that we talked about earlier. This next one is not going to affect too many of you too soon, um, which is about towing. Um, now, one thing is, it's not particularly mentioned here, but it's really important for you to know, um, you're currently looking to pass your driving test, which will allow you to drive a Category B car, uh, manual or automatic. It does not entitle you to a, a B plus E license, which is a license to tow. Um, it, in the past, people who passed the driving test, for example, myself, I automatically got B plus E, so I can tow a caravan or something else without having to take any further training. Um, people that pass the driving test nowadays, that's not the case. Um, so just be aware of that. If you do want to become a caravaner or just help out towing a trailer sometime for a bit of removal or something, um, unless you've taken the additional training and done the additional test, it's not legal. Um, and obviously, if you have an issue, you're not going to be insured and all those issues. But if you do start towing, and this is obviously one of the things you're going to be taught about, um, then you are likely to be going considerably slower than the other traffic. Um, so especially on bendy roads, so sort of places that uh, you'll find a lot of uh, caravanners heading, which is like the lakes or the Yorkshire Dales are very twisty. Um, they're quite awkward for overtaking. Um, it's quite difficult to overtake somebody that's uh, towing a caravan. Um, if you find that you are starting to build up traffic behind you, again, it's good practice to ease over when you can, maybe into a lay-by, allow some people to pass you and then pull back out again. You'll quite often find tractors doing this um, if you do encounter a tractor. I mean, they don't even have to be towing. It might just be a tractor that's set out and about on in between the fields. Um, be aware that they they will do this as well so um, you know rather than try to overtake them somewhere dangerous maybe just be a bit more patient and wait for them to ease over and make your life easier and safer so the final one for tonight is don't loiter get going okay um, again driving is one of these things that really can bring out the worst in people and if people find that they feel as though they're being held up, then they will start to make bad decisions. So when we're out and about, this is why I always try and encourage people to keep up to the speed limit. It's very important you know what the speed limit is. So um, remember, we're looking for tra um, traffic. We're looking for uh, street lamps. So where we've got street lighting, then the speed limit should be 30, unless we're seeing other signs telling us something different. Uh, once we're aware of what the speed limit is, then unless it's unsafe to do so, so bad weather or heavy traffic or maybe um, lots of hazards such as parked cars, that sort of thing, in the absence of those, we should be trying to get up to the speed limit so that we're not unnecessarily holding up other traffic. If you do go too slowly, then you are potentially, again on your driving test, going to pick up a fault for uh, appropriate speed and due hesitation um, and you can fail for that as easily as you can for failing to go too fast. Um, I've had people in the past um, who have maybe had advice or despite my best endeavours have come back and they failed their driving test because they were going too slowly and then they'll try and argue with the examiner to say well that was safe. It isn't necessarily safe if you're driving too slowly then the people around you will start to make poor decisions and try and get past you. So that's why we want to try and avoid that. So as I say, that was the, the last um, item for tonight. Uh, if you want to see those written out, 
then there is a web page that you can visit that uh, details them out. Oh, let's oh, I'll post that a bit later on. It's not letting me post that now. Um, so unless there's any questions, I'm going to sign off now and I'll be uh, putting the video up onto YouTube a bit later for future watching. Okay, I'll take that as no question. So thank you and good night.